Welcome to the Whistleblower Newsroom. I'm Christina Borgeson. Contrary to what he's been saying for the last 10 years, radio show host Alex Jones of Infowars.com has admitted in court that the massacre of 20 children at Sandy Hook was not a hoax and that he believes it was, quote, 100% real. Jones is being sued for defamation damages by parents of Sandy Hook victims who testified that they received death threats and were harassed because of Jones's false claim. The two families are seeking $150 million for defamation and intentional infliction of emotional distress. False sensational claims about what actually happened during major events involving mass deaths, like school shootings, do unfortunately abound, and when repeated often, embed in the public consciousness, sometimes triggering dangerous responses. Why is the truth so hard to get at? One reason could be that those responsible for preventing and responding to these atrocities are not eager to have their incompetence or negligence made public. That said, few in the press ever bother to try to get to the bottom of what really happened either. Only rarely do reporters seem to bother to read official reports and other documents pertaining to these incidents to dig out inconsistencies, unaddressed issues, and misinformation. Nor do they stay on the story long enough to do a thorough investigation. My guest today is the exception. Investigative reporter Kelly O'Meara has arguably covered and deeply investigated more school shootings than any other reporter in this country, if not the world. She's here today to talk about her ongoing investigation into the Uvalde shooting, where 18-year-old Salvador Ramos walked into Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, and killed 19 children and two teachers with an AR-15 rifle. So far, three reports have been issued on this incident, and so far, critical questions remain unanswered. Omira is here to talk about those reports and those unanswered questions. Welcome, Kelly. Hi, Christine. Let's talk about those three reports, when they sure. came out, what they say. People want to understand why these school shootings happen. And I've been looking at school shootings since uh, Columbine. And, um, you know, you want as much information as you can get about the shooter, if possible, such as his mental health treatment that he received, if any, even the kind of drugs he was given. That's very helpful to kind of understand. And you want to know uh, the shooter's home life. And then you want to know what's going on as far as the actual event itself, okay, the, the tragedy that occurs. And unfortunately, what I find after these school shootings is that these reports are, they're just full of holes. They're full of contradictory statements on the part of law enforcement. And so every time there is one of these shootings, I tend to kind of look at the reports that are put out. Surprisingly, Uvalde, it has three reports so far, and that's unusual. Usually you don't get a report until you get the final investigative report. So it's unusual. So I've been looking at these since they came out. And so uh, well, some of the things in it bother me and I would like some clarification. And I think that the family deserve, the families of the dead, they deserve some clarification. And also the people who are gonna be responsible. There are a lot of people in Uvalde, a lot of the law enforcement, the school officials. I think they're facing some real legal challenges ahead. Um, and so I think it's important to, to, to be as, as specific as possible in these reports. And so far, there's just too many questions. So let's start with the first report, okay? And this came out about a month ago. And it was a presentation that was given to the Texas legislature, a uh, special uh, committee of the Texas legislature. And it was given by a gentleman who is the head of public safety in Texas. His name is Colonel McGraw. And so he basically laid out a timeline of everything that happened. And so we'll start with his because it, we'll, we'll, we're going to base the other two off of his initial findings. Okay. So the first thing he says you want to look at the time is 1133 a.m. 
And he says the school shoot the school the shooter enters the classroom through the west door, walks to room one eleven and one twelve, and begins shooting into the classrooms from the hallway. He enters, exits, and re-enters a classroom. Now, the problem I have with this statement is the video that was made public shows Ramos, the shooter coming into the school at 1133, walking down the hallway and shooting from the hallway into the classrooms, okay? But not into the classrooms, into the doors. Well, let's be specific, you have to be specific, okay? He wasn't shooting into the classrooms, he was shooting into the doors. And it's made equally tough because there's a three foot inset into these classrooms, in other words, the classroom doors set three feet into the wall. So the first shot we see is about 16 rounds. That's what I counted if you watch the video. Where he's shooting at the doors from the hallway. You can clearly see this. Then he walks into that three foot inset and you hear more shooting. We don't know if he went in those doors or not. Because based on the video that we've been given, we can't see. We can't see what he's doing once he walks out of the hallway, right? Then he walks back into the hallway and shoots the doors again. And I counted, and I could be wrong, I counted 50 shots before he actually, I believe he actually went into that, uh, those rooms, 111. I think he entered through 111. OK, but so anyway, that's where he kind of starts. But again, the first statement he's making is that he's shooting into the classrooms. I don't think that that's an accurate statement. I think he's shooting at the doors and we'll see that I'm right when we go to the other reports. OK, so then I'm going to go to I'm going to skip a, a lot through his report just because um, it says uh, at 1209. I'm going to skip ahead because some of it is just nonsense. More cops arriving, more cops arriving, more cops arriving. But at 1209, it says a Uvalde police officer requests a master key for the classrooms. OK, so we're assuming the classroom doors are locked. Now it's 1209. They're asking for a master key. Right. And the kid has been in there now for how that's long? A, that's 1133. So he's been in there for an hour already, practically. Well, 40 minutes. And, the and they're looking for a key. Well, how did he get in? Well, wait, wait. No, let's not, let's, we're going to ask all those questions once we get through all these reports, okay? So okay. Her, Colonel McGraw is just setting, he, you know, he's the first guy to put this timeline together and to provide it to the Texas legislature. So then it says at 1211, two minutes later, Pete Arredondo, now, Pete Arredondo is the head of Uvalde uh, a school uh, police, school safety police, if that makes sense. He's not the chief of police of Uvalde. So he says that it says Arredondo at uh, 1211 requests a key and repeats the request five minutes later. So everybody's looking for keys. OK, doors are locked. We need keys. So then we go down to 1228. Now we're almost an hour into the shooting. And it says, Arredondo, again, this is Pete Arredondo, quote, we have master keys and they're not working, unquote. Okay. At 1230, Pete Arredondo again says, okay, we've cleared out everything except for that room. And we assume he's talking about room 111. When he's talking about trying to get into the building and master keys and stuff, mm -hmm. the video shows that they were in there, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes after people were in there, maybe 10 minutes after that kid started shooting. Not even that. They were in there within three minutes of the kid shooting. So here's the thing, the, the west door, the outside door to the building was open. It was not locked, okay? Even though later on they say that we checked the lock and the lock was working, but for some reason, abracadabra, it didn't work that day. So the shooter was able to get into the outside west door. Three minutes later, cops 
were in that building. It wasn't very long. So what is this whole key hunt we're talking about? Because here? the inside doors under Uvalde school system, all schools, this is this is their policy for years. All inside doors, all classroom doors must be locked all the time. Okay. All the time. Not just on a on a lockdown situation, all the time. Is if that school's in session, those doors are supposed to be locked. The outside doors were supposed to be locked too, but for some reason, the west door didn't lock that day. Okay? So they're all trying to find keys to get in classrooms 111 and 112. All right. So so Arredondo, Chief Arredondo, you know, he says, okay, we've cleared everything out. We're ready to breach the door, but it's locked. Now, this is room 111. It's locked. This is the guy, Chief Arredondo, who's standing there and he's saying, it's locked. Okay. Then we go to 1242. Pete Arredondo. Now we're an hour and 15 minutes into the shooting. At 1242, quote, we're having a expletive problem getting in the room because it's locked. He's got an AR-15 and he's shooting everywhere like he's crazy. So he stopped, unquote. 1243, Arredondo. Wait, what do you yeah. mean, so he stopped? So what they're saying is he's in room, the shooter is in room 111. Right. He's, he stopped. He stopped shooting. Oh, okay. He did. 1243. Again, Pete Arredondo. They can't get that door open. We know it. We need more keys or something. All right. Now that's an hour and 15 minutes into the shooting. Okay. And if you look at this video, it's an hour and 17 minutes long. I think you'll see so many police officers, border patrol, wildlife, uh, state police. There is a line in report three that says they had, was it over 300 first responders there almost as many responders as kids that's just crazy yeah almost one responder for each kid that's in the school now remember at 12 43 arredondo is saying we need more keys or something and these are quotes by the way he's yeah these are these are quotes so at 12 47 a sledgehammer is brought in and i'm like a sledgehammer is brought in okay, okay. Three minutes later, McGraw, Colonel McGraw, is telling the legislature the classroom is breached and the gunman shot dead. Now, there's nothing else after that. That's his presentation to the legislature. So you're assuming the sledgehammer opened the door, right? Well, yes. A sledgehammer is brought in. Three Except for later. the fact that I thought that the shooter had shot it open. Just, just don't get ahead of yourself. We're just... Okay. Right now, we're just telling you what the officials are what saying. What the official, pe okay, let's do so, that. All right, I this see. Is, this is what the Texas legislature was first okay. given. So okay. they finally opened it with a sledgehammer is what he's saying. No, he didn't say that. See, this is why I, I'm such a stickler for being really, really. Oh yeah, because parsing out words and reports, that's a classic, uh, that you, can, you can- create and, impressions that, that uh, are false doing right. that. So he says at 1247, a, a sledgehammer is brought in. There's nothing else after that except oh. at 1250, the classroom is breached. So that leads you to believe they use the sledgehammer. Right. Okay. But again, he doesn't say a sledgehammer was used to open right. the door. Exactly. Which if I were providing information to the state legislature, I would have told them that. Is that an important little piece there it's huge okay okay how this how the shooter got into room 111 is very very important because it says a lot then about what happened after he got in okay right. so now we're going to go to this report that came out two weeks after uh, colonel mcgraw addressed the state legislature and this is done by an organization called alert an alert stands for Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training. And what they do is they train police, law enforcement, how to handle school shootings. Now, are so they, they a private company? Yes. And, and who's paying they, them to do this report? I don't know if they were paid to do it, but 
they, they, I think they were asked by the legislature to do it. Okay. okay. So they do an assessment of the investigation so far, right? And what, <laughs> so here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, uh, it says that their report, 113324. Again, we're back to 1133. Upon reaching room 111 and 112, the suspect fired a series of rounds from the hallway in the direction of the classrooms 111 and 112. That's an accurate statement. In the direction of the classrooms. It's not what, you know, Colonel McGraw said, he shot into the classroom, right? So alert is at least being accurate. He's shooting in the direction of the classrooms, the doors. Why doesn't he say he's shooting in the direction of the door? Well, again, that. that would be the best, the best. But at least they're getting closer to being accurate. It's almost like the door is an issue here because nobody wants to say the door. It's a huge issue. And, and okay. you're really going to see it in the third report. Why okay. this is such an issue. Okay. So then alert says at 1133.32, the suspect made entry into what appears to be room 111. How do they know that? We can't see unless they have a video that they have not shown the public, okay? Unless they have a video that has been so enhanced that they can see around that three foot inset, they can't make that statement because you and I have seen the video and anytime he's within that three foot inset, you don't know what he's doing. Right. Okay, so alert now is saying he made entry in a, literally six seconds. He was still shooting at six seconds from the hallway, remember? Anyway, they say he made entry into room 111, which I argue, I argue that that's not accurate because they can't see into that three foot inset. And unless of course they have a video that we've not seen, okay? But based on the video that's been made public, I don't know how they can come to that conclusion. So at 11.33.37, five seconds later, it says the suspect backed out of the classroom of 111 into the south hallway, and he fires more rounds into classroom 112. Well, again, they're making an assumption Wait, here. They said he backs out of the classroom? Yes. Remember and then fires back into the classroom? So remember, Christine, at 1133, whatever, I think it's 08, he's standing in the hall. You can see him shooting into that three foot inset. You can see him shooting into the whatever, whether it's a door or the class, whatever. Then he walks three feet in and you can't see what he's doing. You can hear shooting. I think he's shooting at the doors. Okay. Then he backs out again, shoots some more. Okay. And you can see that clearly on the tape. But he, they're saying, that he comes out of the classroom. He backed out of what appears to be room 111. Well, again, you can't see that. So why are you saying that? I just want to be specific here. And then it says he fires a series of rounds into classroom 112. Well, we don't know if that's where he fired because he's standing again out in the hallway. He's out in the hallway again, shooting again towards those two uh, classroom doors. So. Maybe people call me picky, but I'm a I'm a stickler for specifics. Well, the details are everything. That's where the devil lives is in the details during an investigation. That's for sure. Exactly. Thank you. And so then we go to at uh, 1221. Now we're an, an hour into the shooting. Uh, they discussed uh, who has the keys, testing keys, the probability of the door being locked. And if kids and teachers are dying or dead, this is at 1221. Okay, so then this is <laughs> 15 seconds later, they bring in a Halligan tool. A Halligan is like a bar that they can twist and it breaks the door jam. Now that's there at 1235, an hour into the shooting. They've got a Halligan. The shooting is done by now, isn't it? Yes. They go on to say at 1247.57, a deputy arrives in the West Hallway with a sledgehammer. Okay, so now we got a Halligan and we got a sledgehammer. 
at 1250, an ad hoc team, which we now know were six Border Patrol personnel, assaults room 111, neutralizing the suspect. What I think is interesting, again, is they don't tell you how they entered the room. Sledgehammer? Right. Well, the other it? thing is, the other thing that you were mentioning before to me, before we came on the air, was you said that none of those Border Patrol guys, no, no, none they, of their cameras were on. Yeah, they were wearing them. They just didn't activate them. Now, why do you suppose they didn't do that? Let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay. okay? Anyway, we have this uh, section here where they talk about a Halligan tool was captured uh, on camera at 12, uh, 35, 39, um, and then a sledgehammer at 12, 47. This completed the tool set needed to breach an outward opening door. An outward, okay. So, but again, they don't tell you that they were used. They don't tell you that. Mm -hmm. So then it says the assault team entered the room at 1250.03, one hour, 11 minutes and 26 seconds after the first responding officers took static positions. The assault team, this is the border patrol, had keys that could unlock the door. <laughs> Wait a minute, you're gonna love this. It does. What? It the does door that had been shot in? Wait, wait. It does not appear that any officer ever tested the doors to see if they were locked. As we described earlier, we do not believe the door to room 11, room 111, was locked. He's just telling you that the Border Patrol used a key. And he's going, we don't believe it was locked. So that's, that's the alert report. I just want to make a point here. When they start using all these, they start adding all these extraneous details about now they had, you know, the tools they need to open the door. Now this, now that, which, which are not really germane to how was that door opened? Right. That is a classic signal of, we don't want you to be thinking about this. Just think about this. Exactly. Well, they're just saying things, you know, I kind of, I always refer to, and I know this is probably a bad example, but 9-11 at the Pentagon, they have that video camera of the parking lot <laughs> and it goes, and the headline on USA Today was, you know, photo of the plane hitting the Pentagon. And I'm like, there's that no plane what there. plane? I don't see it. But but everybody believes yeah. it. Oh, no. I mean, there may or may not have been a plane, whatever, but you don't see it in this picture. Exactly. I know. Right. I know. So it's like we can tell you what you're seeing or it's TW 800 where they, you know, 700 eyewitnesses says, hey, we saw something go up in the air. And the CIA says, no, 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 no. That's not what you saw. We'll right. tell you what you saw. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's Orwellian. I know. So, so I feel like I'm dealing with that a little bit here with yes. Vivaldi because they're talking in circles about a Halligan, about a sledgehammer, about master keys. Right. And, you know, it, it, Nothing makes sense. So now we're going to move on to the big report. This is 82 pages long, and it's a preliminary report by the state uh, Texas House of Representatives Investigative Committee. There's a lot of detail in this report. It says room 111 could be locked, but an extra effort was required to make sure the latch engaged. Okay, an extra effort. Many knew room 111's door had a faulty lock and the school district police had specifically warned the teacher about it. So this is before anything happened. This, right. this door right. had a problem. It, it, it had a lock on it, but the lock wasn't working. Well, that's what this report is saying. Okay. We're going to find out later on that may not necessarily be true. Okay. Oh my God. So, All right. This is quite the door story, this you wrote. It is a door story, shooting. but this, but this <laughs> is so important, Christina. Yeah, yeah, no, I know. Because what happens after that door is breached matters a lot. Well, when that door, when was that door breached and who breached it? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's what's important. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, so in violation of school policy, no one had locked any of the three exterior doors. Okay even though they know this is policy, this is, 
In fact, they have lockdown all the time there. Um, the last one I saw on Facebook, they had a lockdown on March 9th. You know, and that's like a, you practice, right? So they know what they're all supposed to do. So they're saying on this day, three of the exterior doors weren't locked. So, you know, easy to get in. So then it says... Um, which is unusual. Was that unusual? I mean, no. even though they're supposed to be locked, um, I just wonder if that was particularly unusual. No, you know, it wasn't. The, the perfect timing of this shooter choosing this day and the school on that day not locking three doors. I'm just wondering, you know, were those three doors often unlocked is my question. Yes. They often were unlocked. It was kind of a, a laissez-faire attitude about locking the doors. Okay. Okay. And this is why I say, legally, the school system. Yeah, that's a problema for the school. They got a problem. Sure. Mm -hmm. And the teachers who didn't lock the doors. Okay. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> so it says. That's um, lawsuit material. Huge. Huge. Yeah, that's lawsuit material. It says, uh, once inside, the attacker continued into the joining rooms 111 and 112, probably through door 111, and apparently completely unimpeded. That's what this report says. Apparently. Unimpeded. Okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know. Okay? We don't know. We we don't know yet because none of the other reports have said they, they've said they used a key. They've said they used a sledgehammer and they had to the halligan. Right? So we don't really know. So then it goes on to say, um, and I find this really helpful, and I'm hoping that when they come out with their final report, it will be it will be made available. Does the committee and its investigators have reviewed hundreds of crime scene photos and dozens of audio and video recordings of the incident, including surveillance camera footage, mobile phone video, 911 calls, radio transmissions, and body-worn camera footage. So we know they have crime scene photos, okay? So it says uh, the committee received thousands of pages of documents received from numerous agencies, including ALERT, ATF, Texas DPS, FBI, Texas School Safety Center, and the Uvalde CISD. So they have all the information uh, that they need, except it says three exterior doors, two of which required to remain locked. Each classroom in the West Building had a door to a hallway, which policy required to remain locked at all times. The interior classroom doors also were required to remain closed and locked at all times. The interior doors were solid metal with a small pane of glass and could only be locked from the outside using a key. In other words, this is something that they need to address. The teachers had to literally, literally walk out of the room have with a key. They had to have the key, lock the door, then go back in the room and close the door. What's Fine. important here, I think, is were those doors were those doors locked on that day when the shoot, you know, when the shooter encountered those doors. And he right. was the first one to encounter those doors. That's right. He was the first one. That's right. And so the fact that he got into the classroom and he was the first one mm -hmm. room 111 was his fourth grade class okay so did he know at that time that the doors were supposed to be locked all the time and yeah, they but weren't it's, i feel like that's besides the point i i it feel is. what is the point is if you watch that video that kid goes down there with that gun he shoots the gun and then he disappears into that three feet of partition he, there. Right. And then, then he, he backs out, shoots again. Okay. Yeah. And then he goes into, and then he apparently gets so into the classroom. If he's already in the classroom, why are you looking for keys and, you know, all kinds of tools to get in there? Because he's already in there. But it gets, it here, it gets, let, let, let's go through the report. Okay. okay. So it says, according to numerous witnesses who testified before the committee, the door to room 111 could lock, although it took some extra effort. Okay. It says, uh, yeah, this is like, it's like extraneous report information, which is that whole thing about what I was telling. They give you, we give you this 85 page report, 
you know, about two pages of it are really germane to what we want to know here. But right. go ahead. Oh, it's so it says Rob Elementary Maintenance records confirm the lack of any written work order to repair the door for rooms 111 and 112. So this will become very important because, you know, the principal of the school was suspended because she didn't do her job. She didn't make sure the doors were locked. So she was suspended, but we'll get into her at the end, okay? <laughs> so the maintenance guy is testifying to the committee, hey, I never got a work order. If this teacher in 111 said my door won't lock, I would have- It's like it. they're creating a door gate over something that is, is besides the point. Because at that point, because the kid got in there before everybody else did. Uh -huh. And so the question is, was that door still open after he got in? And it seems to me that the way he got in was by shooting in. I mean, that's what you you hear anyway. Mm -hmm. And so why are you because Christina here, talking about the I, maintenance problem with this? We're having a big issue here with room 111, the lock on room 111. Yeah. And they're talking about it all the time. Right. Because they're using that as the excuse as to why the police failed to go into the classroom for an hour and 17 minutes. So there are a couple of weird things about this, Kelly. Yeah. Well, the first one is that these reports are saying things that they can't prove. In other words, uh, with your viewers, if they watch the video, they see that the shooter is standing outside the classrooms in the hallway. He shoots about 16 rounds. He walks into that three foot inset, shoots about another 15 rounds, backs out of that three foot inset and shoots again, which is about, I say 20 more rounds. That's like almost 50 rounds. And you're going, okay, well, does it make sense that if he actually had entry into the classroom, why would he back back, you know, back out again and shoot some more back in again? It doesn't make sense. He would have been in already. There's no need for him to come back in the hallway. Okay. So the fact that these reports are suggesting that he just, you know, walked into the room because it was unlocked, I find that very, very difficult to accept. Not just that. He does this whole back and forth, and then he disappears into that inset. And then you, you hear, I don't know how many rounds it is, Kelly. I mean, he's just blasting away. Just I counted like 50. Away. I counted like 50 in, in that maybe 40 second time period, I heard about 50 shots. Now it could have been more, it could have been less, but I heard about 50. That's gotta be when he's killing people. No, because once he goes, doesn't come back into the hallway ever again, you can still hear him shooting in the classroom. It's a different sound. Okay, you're hearing a different sound from the hallway to him being in the classroom. But in this video, he he's in already into the classroom already by the time these police guys yes. come up. Yes. Okay. And I'll tell you what's very strange to me, Kel. Mm -hmm. I don't hear one scream. I, I didn't either. Not one. Even from kids in the other classrooms. For, just forget the ones that are actually being shot at. You think kids in the other classrooms might be crying or screaming or scared. You don't hear any child's voice. Now, Did they edit that out? Is that possible? They said they sent this to Quantico, to FBI, to have it um, enhanced twice. This well, video. if they're enhancing it, then you'd really hear the screen. If they enhance the video, yes. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the sound, I find the sound quality quite bad, actually. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. hard to understand what those cops are saying to each other. And that one cop, the, the one who goes up to the door, and then he comes back, something hit him in the head, he comes back. They're all terrified, clearly, but they all have, you know, they all have their vests on, their bulletproof vests on. 
it's it's you can see the travesty right there. But I'm telling you, I'm a little weirded out by the fact that I don't hear anybody screaming and yelling and I don't hear anybody crying out. I don't hear any of that. Right. I don't know what to make of that. And I agree with you. I don't hear it either. Are there any other anomalies that you want to talk about before we start comparing anomalies among the other major school shootings? The other question is room 112, right? Where the teacher, Miss Garcia, and uh, the other teacher were killed. Now, they said that they saw her, a teacher across the hall saw her come out and lock her door. So again, her door wasn't locked like it was supposed to be because she had to come out and lock it. Anyway, so the teacher across the hall in room 105 saw Miss Garcia come out and lock her door and go back in. So we know 112 was locked. One of the children who survived in room 112 also said her teacher went out and locked room 112. Now, the guy who was shot, the teacher who was shot in room 111, He's the only one to survive room 111. And um, he doesn't remember if he locked the door. Uh, he's been shot. He's been in the hospital. I get it. You know, he's been through something traumatic. Now, if he hadn't locked that door, he'll probably never in a million years admit it because my God. Anyway, he know. doesn't remember. He doesn't remember whether he locked the door or not. So I want to bring up one point, And that is important to me because the principal of the school had only been the principal for a year. Okay, now she had been a teacher at Robb Elementary for a long time. Okay, 15 years, I think. Anyway, when she got suspended, uh, she responded with her attorney uh, to being suspended. And here's what she said. Number one, the door to room 111 is checked by custodial staff every evening to ensure it is locked. It was locked when checked the evening before the tragedy. This establishes the door locks. Number two. The teacher in charge of that classroom has to unlock that door every morning to let himself and his students in. He unlocked that door that morning so that he could enter. This establishes that the door locks. Number three, the teacher in charge of that classroom complained on more than one occasion that because the door did lock, his workday was interrupted because of the printer, because of people using the printer from other classrooms. This also establishes that the door locks. She says, <clears throat> but Kelly, Kelly, wait, wait, wait. Why are we doing this door stuff? Be- the door, Look. the door obsession for them is like a, it's, it's to me, there's a, that's where the cover up is focused. It is, but you understand, Christine, you're missing the point, And this is why it's so important. Okay. It is terribly important whether that door was locked or not. Why? Because 347 cops are at that school. Okay, and all of them are waiting to do something because they're saying the door is locked. And I'm saying, prove to me that that door was locked. I suspect that kid shot the hell out of that door. Okay, that's how he entered that room. Well, what are the implications? Excuse me. What are the implications? If that door had been shot to hell. And they're sitting out there playing a, a game. I mean, literally think of the lies. Oh, it's locked. We can't get in. We need keys. We need a sledgehammer. We need a halligan. Christina, do you understand the conspiracy? Yeah. They're all lying. Now, let me add, let me add the caveat. There are no pictures of this door. None. Everybody's wearing body cams except the Border Patrol who breached the door. They're the people that breached the door. No body cams were activated. Why? Don't you well, that- certainly there have to be crime scene photos of that door. Okay, in the report, in the report, it actually says, yeah, we have photos of the door. Well, why the hell didn't you show us a picture of the door? Yeah, I'd like to see a picture of that door. Here's the other thing that bothers me. All those cops in that hallway for an hour and 17 minutes, back and forth, back and forth. Not one of them goes, wow, did you see all the bullets in that door? Wow, he really shot up those doors. That's what I would have said. What I don't understand is why they didn't swarm that door. They're blaming this on Ardondo. You realize that. Well, no, wait a second now. Who, who you, you said the guy with the gun, the who was like the first one to even go down there? Yeah, he's, just a, a poli- he, he's just a police officer that, that went in with two other guys. They were like the first to arrive. What do you mean arrive. he's just a police officer? He's 
done the training just like everybody else. He's supposed to go down there and he's supposed to charge in there and kill right. that guy. Right. So, you know, he's gone down there and he peeks in, you know, or and whatever. He gets he, shot at. He gets shot at. Yeah. He said something about hit something hit his head or something. And he immediately comes back and crouches, you know, crouches behind uh Right. You know, crouches next to the wall and then he goes back up a little bit. He doesn't go all the way back ever again. Right. None and of I'm do. just looking at this guy and everybody else is just standing around and, and they're talking and I and the sound is very bad. The sound yes. is very bad. But the sound before all those guys arrive and start talking, you is it's very clear all this shooting going on. Right. And it's very clear the silence of the people being shot at. Yes. I mean, there's no kids crying, nothing. There's no, there's, there's no sound of a child in that school. God, that's so bizarre. So anyway, this uh, principal, I, I think she did a good job defending herself in this. And they actually reinstated her two days later because Hey, the door locked. Right. So my question is, Show me how the shooter got in that room. Because if that shooter shot his way in, that door was open the whole time. And they yeah, that gone door in. was open they for you, too. If it was time. open for him, it was open for you. Yeah, right? exactly. So show us the door. Show us the door. Because we know they have photos. It's in their report. They took photos of the door. Well, also, that guy... Mr. Mr. The guy who the cop who went down there while th that shooting was going on and he came back because something right. hit him. Right. He saw what condition the door was in for sure. Right. Yes. A lot of them did. But nobody's saying anything. Nobody's and it, well, and also if something hit him in the back of the head, how where did that come from? It was a piece of uh, wall. He was shooting through the wall. So it was a piece of like drywall that hit him in the back of his head. Oh, okay. So I understand that because there's one part in the video where you can see he there's shooting coming out of the class. Yes, you can see you can see this white plume of, of stuff coming out of the the uh... the drywall. I get it. The kid has he's shooting for sure, but <clears throat> all I'm saying is, and also if he's shooting, if the drywall is coming out, he's definitely inside because but... the <laughs> drywall is coming out. From inside the, the classroom. Exactly. Uh -huh. The other question, those two classrooms, 111 and 112, are separated by a door. They can go in and out of those classrooms by a middle door. Right. Which is always supposed to be locked. Always. Oops. He just walked right through. They're always supposed to be locked. So I look at this and I go, look, these families just have enormous amount of lawsuits for sure. But once they get through their heartache, you know, clearly... There were some balls dropped with this, uh, with people. Well, locking. definitely the door thing is, is there, is there money, uh, is there money issue? Yeah. And then, then, then you go to the police who, you know, 347 police officers, you know. That's complete anything. dereliction of duty, what they did. And boy, it's, they, they are filmed doing it. They are filmed doing it. As you saw in that clip that we just played. But it's worse than that because they've all been trained on, on since Columbine, as a matter of fact, Columbine taught uh, police that, you know, wait, you have to go in immediately. That's what Columbine did. And that's why they set up this training. You never wait. You go in. And instead, they waited for an hour and 17 minutes. In the third report, they said that the cops were acting as if they were dealing with a barricaded shooter as yeah. opposed to an active shooter. And I thought to myself, why are you even saying that? They're not acting as if they there's even a barricaded shooter. You know, they're acting as if they are afraid to go in there or they don't want to go in there. They're stopping other people who want to go in there. Or there's what no is need going to go on? in there. We need to figure out how the kid got in there. Once we figure that out, then we can start filling in the blanks for the other for the, well, what happened after that? The video doesn't nail it completely on the head, mm -hmm. but between the video and the sound, mm -hmm. 
you can pretty much piece together exactly what happened with this kid. Let's talk about the kid for a minute because everybody knew and he made no bones about how nuts he was. So let's talk about that. First of all, they haven't released any information whether or not he had uh, any kind of mental health treatment. We know that um, his last year of school was ninth grade. How bizarre is that? Ninth grade? He, he was, you know, 18 years old or 17. He should have been graduating from high school. Well, he was a troubled kid, so I'm sure he would miss school all the time. And if you miss school, like however many days during the year, you, you're basically flunked. He was either repeating classes or even not going to class. I don't know. He didn't, but that's, but, how you, that's how you're in ninth grade at his age. No, that's not necessarily so. Um, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to say that because usually in today's world, when a kid is not going to school and they're truant, um, the counselors in the school, the teachers in the school, the print, they, they, they go and they get help. They, they go to the parent and they say, you know, is there problems at home? Um, do you need to talk to a mental health counselor? Um, we want to make sure he gets through school. They're all over it. Why? Because the state pays them to do that. They get paid to do so that. So what they happened in, with this kid? They bring in DCFS. Here's what bothers me. If you read this report, this 82-page report, they just skip through four years of his life. They go from ninth grade to he killed people. They just skip through four years. Oh. Where's this four years? So that's the second big issue because now we're hiding, we're hiding his mental health history. We're hiding how the system dealt with him. What I'm concerned about is they're going, well, the high school just decided to disenroll him. That's not how it works in today's world, Christine. You don't just disenroll somebody. You go through a lot of hoops with the parents or their whoever's in control of him, okay, his grandmother or whatever. They're, you're in there all the time and they're doing everything they can to get him on board. That's how it works in today's world. You don't get to just disenroll. <laughs> doesn't work that way but that's what they're leading you to believe this report he had to have attended school at least until he was is it 17 i think it's 17 okay so again just saying oh we just decided to disenroll him i don't believe that i'm not buying that okay i just am not there was a lot of effort there had to be a lot of effort to get this kid on a straight and narrow because schools are paid to do that they get lots of federal money for that you know, I don't see any big issues. He he had a very dysfunctional uh, family. Yes, uh, sure. His mother and his father were fairly irresponsible, I, I think, based on what I've read. He was living with his grandmother and grandfather at the time. Um, and he had, I think what amazed me, if you read the report, he'd never shot a gun before. Never. Yeah. Right? yeah. I find that bizarre. Yeah. You know, in fact, his uncle, who they his uncle they question he brought the guns to his uncle's house and his uncle was trying to teach him how to put the clip into the gun and he couldn't do it it kept falling out he didn't know how to do it but this okay. kid has never handled a weapon and then he decides i'm gonna buy an ar-15 i'm gonna go to yeah and that's and so the question is too the adults around him knowing how troubled he is i, I wonder why there was no Right. Well, I guess if everybody's dysfunctional, the fact that he's buying a gun is, well, oh, well, I, I don't know. I don't want to speculate about that. What else is weird about his situation? Well, you know, again, because they've left out four years, almost four years of his life in this report, it's hard to tell what he was doing. You know, plus COVID. Remember COVID? Everybody was learning from home. And right. so it's, it's hard to tell, you know, right. when he went down this path they said he was bullied in fourth grade he was bullied okay and we know that because the school got involved and they do that's why i'm not kind of buying the you know we just disenrolled him it's true about the covid thing those those are like lost years because a lot of kids were at home so who knows what they were doing exactly but still they would have records of whether or not he was delivering his homework his interactions with his teachers was he uh being dealt with at all uh by the mental health community was he we on don't a... have any we, that we don't have any information on that 
In fact, the, the report says he didn't have any mental health assistance. I find that's kind of an interesting word, assistance. How about treatment? I don't know, and I don't think they've given us enough information about this kid. Still, to this day. They are doing a toxicology report. Yes, they are. And this will be very, very important because in Sandy Hook, um, you know, they reported that, oh, he wasn't on any drugs and blah, 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 blah. Right? Right. Uh, Adam, Adam Lanza, the, the school Oh, they first in reported that? Oh, yeah. No, no. That's what they said, that's what they said in, in, the, in the report at the time of the shooting when he died. He didn't have any drugs in his In system. what report was this? The they... toxicology report for Sandy Hook. Said he had no drugs in his system. Right. Okay. But then we come to find out that the ME, the medical examiner, didn't request the test for the to test for those drugs. Why? I don't know. The medical examiner's dead. When did he die? About five years ago. So we don't know. We don't know why he didn't require didn't request the appropriate test to find out if he was on any kind of antipsychotics or antidepressants or whatever. Do you think that was intentional? Yes. Why would they do that? Well, it would certainly give you a reason if the kid has been on, you know, psych drugs for his whole life. We know he was when he was younger. He was uh, because the mother reported it to the uh, Yale Child Care Center. I think that's what it's called. Uh, Yes. Anyway, so we know that he had taken antidepressants at a very young age. So it would it would tell us if in fact the kid may have been affected by mind-altering drugs. There are so many other anomalies in the Lanza case. Mm-hmm. I mean, he did that all that ballistics work. Well, they said that none of the bullets, the actual uh, bullets, uh, they said they weren't able to uh, get a match on the, uh, on the guns that were used. And I'm like, you know, it's like 149, 148 bullets that they pulled from the room, the bodies, you know, but they were you know, so distorted that they, they couldn't get a match. And I'm like, well, that's bizarre. What are the odds that every single bullet pulled from Sandy Hook doesn't match the barrel of the gun or they can't get it to? The odds to me, they have to be enormous. And no DNA, you know, no fingerprints on these guns. I'm like, that's bizarre. How did that happen? Lanza's DNA and fingerprints were not on the, these right. uh, Wow. So again, you know, and that report, the the Connecticut State investigation, when they put that report out, I got to tell you, I never saw such a horrible report in my life as far as, um, you know, there's no index. Usually, you know, you can go, oh, you know, chapter one is ballistics. Chapter two is eyewitnesses. Chapter three. They just stuffed everything into that report willy nilly. I mean, you had to read thousands of pages you had to read it all because there wasn't going to just, oh, let's go to ballistics and see what they said there. There's stuff in everywhere. So I don't know if that was by, you know, accident. By design. <laughs> or by design. Yeah. But yeah. it was tough. And that's why nobody reads these reports. None of the press read these reports. So there are still some major questions, unanswered questions with the Sandy Hook. Yeah, and boy, this me. is this is such a hot topic item because uh, obviously Alex Jones <laughs> is in some deep trouble. Alex Jones actually made some claim that nobody died at Sandy Hook. Whenever you have investigations that, you know, the physical evidence in a case, like for instance, there are testimonies, there's there's testimony by kids who were in the school who were who survived, and they said, Oh, well, he looks like He looks like my dad. My dad has a beard. Well, Adam Lanza didn't have a beard. Exactly. Yeah, but to say that no kids died, that's, that's, you know. Well, I didn't get into Alex Jones' investigation. I don't know what he has. I read the report uh, myself several times and and printed out 600 pages of it so I could highlight it because I found that many weird nuances. Anomalous stuff, yeah. Yeah. We have to uh, we have to discuss that that report because uh, well, of the work that you did on that too. Amazing. I'm waiting for I'm uh, waiting for the the Illinois shooter. You know the the part the uh, the kid that just shot up uh, the parade in uh, in uh, in Illinois. You know, I mean, this kid totally was on uh, psych drugs and he totally had a mental health history, and yet 
Nobody's released any of that information. But we know it. We know it. But they won't release what he was on. Why? Why do they always want to either suppress that information or distort that information with these school shootings? Because you were the well, first person to report that there was a connection between most school shootings and these antidepressant drugs. Right. Well, it, it's a mitigate. It's a mitigating factor. If you have a kid on psychotropic drugs, mind altering drugs from a very early age. Right. And a lot of these kids are put on Ritalin, then antidepressants, then, you know, antipsychotics or a cocktail of these drugs. They're literally out of their 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 mind. Right. They're out of their mind. It's a mitigating factor. But beyond that, for me, now again, I'm not excusing the criminal behavior. What they did was criminal. And they must they must be judged for that. Okay. What I'm saying though is having that information, whether or not they were on any kind of psychotropic drug, helps us to understand, okay, why these things happen. If we start seeing that all the shooters are on these drugs, well, there's a connection. Meanwhile, yeah. these crazy reports keep coming out, you know, one one, you know, generating more questions than the next. We've run out of time, but I just want to tell you that uh, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. I mean, I I really do believe that you're the only person, you're the only reporter, investigative reporter in this country who has been following all of this stuff. Well, again, look, the bottom line here is for the families of these victims, they deserve, you know, a, a legitimate investigation with clarity i'll also argue it's not just the families of the victims um although first and foremost they deserve answers but people who are being subjected they may not have lost a child but to send your child to school with your heart in your mouth every day right fearful because some kid is out there plotting to come in and shoot up a few people you know, that doesn't give anybody a warm, fuzzy feeling. That's the same thing with TWA. They used to say, why can't you just drop this? You know, you're you're forcing the victim's family members to relive, a, you're re-traumatizing right. them. And it's like, <clears throat> dude, people get on airplanes every day out of JFK to go to Paris and to go to other places using that same corridor right. where... TWA exploded in in midair. So yeah, I'm not just doing this for the victims' family or the victims, God rest their souls. Uh, you know, I'm doing this for all of us, and we should all be asking these questions for all of us. Right. So right. that's Absolutely. why I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.